Hi guys, it is another hot, sweltering, red flag, wildfire warning day here in the great state of Texas where I am on day number five of what is probably a uh, corona panic. Uh, anyway, here in the 95 degree heat, I think we have made it into Wednesday, April. I don't know, guys. What the hell does it matter? I don't know. I, I have no clue what the date is. So somewhere around the 12th or 13th. So anyway, uh, I want to uh, tip the old Doomer hat. Once again, to good old Common Dreams, those little lefties over at Common Dreams who uh, surprise me uh, sometimes with uh, who they get on here. And Richard Heinberg, our old buddy Richard Heinberg, uh, is here on uh, Common Dreams today with some of the most intelligent commentary I have ever heard about them globalist them globalist and so we're going to get Richard Heinberg's uh, reading on global elites here in common dreams uh, take it away Richard uh, oh yeah well for those of you who are not familiar with uh, Richard Heinberg's work uh, Richard Heinberg is a senior fellow at the Post Carbon Institute and the author of 14 books, including his most recent from last year called Power, Limits and Prospects for Human Survival. Yes, okay. So, uh, Richard Heinberg, share with us your feelings on global elites, the failure of global elites, and what you should do next. It's difficult to convey the degree and depth of elites' failure without descending into lurid disaster porn. <laughs> All right, take it away, Richard. In the 1970s, global political and corporate elites had all the information they needed to put the world on a path toward long-term stability. Systems science was sufficiently advanced. We're talking 50 years ago. System science was sufficiently advanced that a team of its practitioners organized a scenario study and I'm quite sure he's talking about, surely he's talking about limits to growth, that famous Club of Rome uh, study f uh, from 50 years ago that all of these right-wing conspiracy wackos call a blueprint for the depopulation agenda. I'm pretty sure we're talking about this. Systems science was sufficiently advanced that a team of its practitioners organized a scenario study to see how trends in industrial production, population, food, pollution, and resource usage might, intera might interact over the next few decades, meaning until now. The study showed that continued growth in population and industrial production would prove unsustainable. Hmm. Political scientists were beginning to sort demographic, economic, and historical social, social data for clues to understanding why societies sometimes descend into internal violence. Data seemed to show that there was a rough correlation between rising economic inequality and declining social stability. Also, and this of course the most important one, the science of ecology was revealing 
that forest, ocean, desert, <coughs> fresh water, and soil, soil ecosystems are all inherently complex and resilient, but that they are subject to catastrophic tipping points when subjected to high enough levels of pollution or loss of habitable space. It was clear 50 years ago what should be done in order to put society on a sound footing. Number one on the list, discourage population growth. Number one on the list. 50 years ago, <clears throat> ecologists were saying discourage population growth when this planet's population was less than one half of what it is now. That is the number one directive. Cap the scale of industrial production. Reduce economic inequality. Clean up pollution. Reduce, I mean, clean up past pollution. Reduce current and future pollution. And anyone remembering the Georgia Guidestones might uh, recognize this advice. Leave plenty of space for nature to regenerate. Leave room for nature. Leave room for nature. It is the only one of the ten, it was the tenth commandment of the Georgia Guidestones, which these uh, right wing conspiracy wacko depopulation agendas, if they have to hold up two blueprints for, uh, for how the global elites are planning to kill us all, it is the limits to growth study from the Club of Rome and the Georgia Guidestones leave room for nature. And the Georgia Guidestones had 500 million as a recommended uh, global population. Okay, so that was 50 years ago, the Georgia Guidestones and the limits to growth, and system science ecologists told us what needed to be done. But elites did not do those things. Hmm, despite what the depopulation agenda wackos are saying, elites did not do those things. Initially, during the Nixon and Carter years, U.S. politicians enacted some thoughtful, far-reaching policies, then increasingly and regardless of the party in power. This has nothing to do with Democrats or Republicans since the end of the Jimmy Carter administration, okay? Let's just get this straight. <clears throat> Regardless of the party in power, they simply found excuses to stop pressing ahead or to backtrack. They set their pet economists to work writing books and reports insisting that growth is always good. Growth is good. Growth is good. <clears throat> yes, growth is always good. That economic inequality is excusable because eventually the wealth of the few will surely trickle down as benefits to the many and that in President Ronald Reagan's feel good but tragically misleading words, quote, there are no such things as limits to growth because <coughs> there are no limits to the human capacity for intelligence, <coughs> imagination, <coughs> and <coughs> wonder.
Yes, Richard Heinberg quoting Ronald Reagan. Uh, <clears throat> where else are you going to hear that? Elites, back, you know, initially, elites were not entirely unified on these points. Those who tilted toward the left of the political spectrum were skeptical about trickle-down economics and push for more social welfare programs and environmental regulations. But their proposals, meaning these little lefty proposals, were, for the most part, relatively tame. Virtually no, virtually no influential members of the global elite regardless of whether they were left, right, Democrat, conservative, whatever, virtually no influential members of the global elite proposed deliberately reining in industrial production and only a few nations made significant efforts to reduce population growth and uh, probably didn't have room, but of course, every one of those uh, very few uh, countries who uh, made efforts to reduce population growth have completely backtracked on that and are now, in fact, pulling out all the stops to increase population growth that this, uh, the entire agenda by the global elites on the left and the right is to pack more people onto this planet. That is their number one agenda to see how many human beings can be crammed onto a planet, make no mistake, what the globalist agenda on this planet is about. But I'm getting off into my own rant. Okay. Where were we? Political conservatives, i.e. those folks who strove to conserve existing social power relations, tended to be more resolute. Their agenda consisted of an unyielding promotion of industrial expansion, population increase, and conversion of nature into goods and services with as few regulations on pollution as possible. And I would say that that end of the global elite spectrum has completely gone into overdrive here in 2022. <clears throat> Even if the ideological contest was in some ways a stalemate with Western democracies like the U.S. seeing repeated shifts between liberal and conservative political dominance, conservatives effectively succeeded in blocking societal stabilization. Their success greatly aided by the fact that liberals had not really argued for stopping growth in population or industrial production. Indeed, for all their disagreements, liberals and conservatives settled on one thing, growth, you know, in terms of population, GDP, and all the rest. Liberals and conservatives settled on one thing, growth, globalization, and neoliberal economic policies would help solve all problems from poverty to pollution. Unfortunately, they were thereby united in a perilous lie, which has been, you know, the bedrock 
of global industrial capitalism for the past 50 years. A perilous lie. This entire system, the entire globalist system is built on a lie. Okay, a tiny few people understand this. I mean, the right-wing wackos have their ideas what the big lie is. The left-wing wackos have their idea what the big lie is, while a few doomers understand what the big lie is. You cannot have infinite growth on a finite planet. Okay? The big lie behind all the other lies, between the bright green lies and every other one, is the globalist elite big lie that you can have infinite growth on a finite planet. Do you understand it doesn't matter if they're lefties or right wing, whatever. And uh, anybody who does not understand you cannot have growth on, an inf uh, on a finite planet uh, is uh, playing under the big lie, the perilous lie, the big lie that is taking down this planet. This is, thank you, Richard Heinberg. Okay, where are we now? Now... Society is clearly on a path toward critical instability. I, I think everybody will agree with that. Now, society is clearly on a path toward critical instability. And of course, I would add society and the planet. Climate change threatens to swamp coastlines, trigger severe droughts and floods, and make access to food and water far more problematic for billions of people. At the same time, demographers predict global population will reach almost 10 billion people by 2050, adding to the challenges. Yes, levels of inequality and debt have been rising for decades. Hormone disrupting chemical pollution is altering sperm counts in humans. Well, you know, we do have one glimmer of hope. Thank God that hormone disrupting chemical pollution is altering sperm counts in humans. But the flip side of that, it is also altering sperm counts in a host of other animals. Threatening near universal sterility, again, uh, anything that is threatening universal human sterility is the only way out of this mess. But of course, we're going to take down every one of our fellow earthlings with us on our way out. Wild nature is in retreat almost everywhere with the numbers of mammals, birds, amphibians, reptiles, fish, and now insects nosediving. Current waves of economic, political, and climate refugees portend future floods of displaced humanity as the socio-ecological system unravels further. And in the U.S., the core nation of the global industrial system, political polarization, gridlock, and increasing levels of political violence impede the ability of elites to solve even the problems they deign to acknowledge. <laughs> I think that was a good summation of our unstable, our critically unstable society and planet in 2022 as I have ever read. Okay. In America, trust in government has been declining since the 1950s throughout the period of economic globalization as the transformation of former Midwestern industrial heartlands into flyover country 
led to vanishing economic opportunity for large swaths of the populace, respect for elites increasingly turned to widespread and deep suspicion of them. Sensing the threat to their own legitimacy and control, elites tried harder to sell their policies by promising that everyone would eventually benefit from globalization's cheap consumer products or by distracting their bases with hot-button cultural issues. But declining but declining perceived legitimacy led to deeper divisions among the elites themselves. In the last decade, those divisions erupted into the election of Donald Trump, the passage of Brexit in the UK, and the rise of nationalist populist authoritarian leaders around the world, you know, from Donald Trump to Bozo Nero to Vladimir Putin to all the rest of them. Uh, for elite aspirants, new communications technologies, especially social media, hmm, offered the opportunity to influence the public continually and instantly. However, these new technologies were especially useful to members of the anti-establishment, including the alt-elites like Donald Trump, in spreading disinformation and conspiracy theories. Wow. Social media spreading conspiracy theories. Now, big segments of the American public don't just disagree with elites on specific policies. Rather, they hate at least some elites with a burning passion, thinking uh, Bill Gates being the number one, although Klaus Schwab is taking more and more thunder out from away from Bill Gates as the global elite elitist to hate the most. Large numbers of, conser of conservatives believe that liberal leaders are fundamentally evil, that they are quite literally pedophilic, Satan-worshipping baby killers. <coughs> Meanwhile, supporters of liberal elites believe that conservative leaders most of who have morphed into Trumpian anti-elites are neo-Nazis bent on enforcing Christian nationalist, misogynist, homophobic white supremacy. While many of these beliefs are not true, which means he's saying, I guess, some of the beliefs are true, the anger is real and seemingly unquenchable. As political temperatures rise to searing levels, the public is increasingly riled by labels and posturing, while the actual core failure of elites, both liberal and conservative, goes unnamed and undiscussed. This is anyone wanting to know why I named my farm Bugs in a Jar Farm. These are the bug shakers. While they get all of us fighting here in the jar, the, the sadist shaking the jar, the globalist uh, elitist, both liberal and conservative, <coughs> go right on about business. While their failure goes unnamed and undiscussed, that core failure consists of permitting society 
to proceed along a path of unchecked growth that inevitably produces worsening economic inequality and environmental degradation. Efforts to maintain continual growth have been financed by mountains of debt that can never be repaid and could come crashing down in mere days. And from a physical standpoint, growth has been founded on the depletion of finite natural resources, thus ensuring that expansion will be self-limiting and will likely end in the mother of all crashes. Though the situation is simple to grasp and outline, the public understands almost none of this because elites, liberal, conservative, and alt benefit from this lack of awareness. Wow! Keep them in the dark and fighting among themselves. Divide and conquer. So anyway, guys, I don't know. Uh, this uh, excellent essay goes on and on. I'm just going to sit here and read this until the camera goes off. If the camera goes off, I'll put the link and you can finish it up. Liberals wring their hands over problems of social injustice, no doubt genuinely outraged, but also hoping to maintain the support of women, people of color, <coughs> immigrants, and LGBTQ folks. <coughs> Yet, none of these liberal interest groups is encouraged to see its plight in the context of the uber story of our times, the arc of unsustainable fossil fueled population and consumption growth bending toward an inevitable collision with environmental limits. <clears throat> I think Ted Kaczynski wrote an essay from prison about this, <clears throat> that all of this other crap, all of this little uh, lefty social justice warrior uh, talks and everything else, fine and dandy, but in the context of the collapse of a planet it means nothing. Everything is a distraction to the uber story of our times. <clears throat> so those are the lefties. Meanwhile, conservatives work overtime twisting together new conspiracy theories they can tighten around the necks of powerful liberals. Did you know that the Great Reset a phrase employed by Klaus Schwab, the executive chairman of the World Economic Forum, is actually a plan by shadowy masters of government and finance to use the corona panic, which was, of course, planned well in advance as an excuse to gain total dictatorial control over every person on earth if they can force you to wear a mask or get vaccinated during a pandemic what else can they make you do well you know guys i have to break in here for a minute and say even a a uh, a broken uh clock you know like alex jones likes to say uh, when granting uh, something to a liberal that even a broken clock is right twice a day. And uh, if they can force you, not encourage you, to wear a mask and take a vaccine, if they can force you, if they can mandate you 
to wear a mask and get a vaccine, I think it's an intelligent question to ask what else can they make you do? But anyway, we're not going to go there. Did you know that climate change is a hoax ginned up by crafty scientists hungry for more research funding? And that those same shadowy government and financial elites, along with Hollywood movie stars, of course, <coughs> are going to use global warming as an excuse to take away your car and force you to eat fake meat? Well, if you didn't already know that, it's time to wake up and make sure you're wearing a tinfoil hat to block attempts they might use to control your mind. So, just who are these dastardly elites? Though politicians take most of the heat, some ire might be justifiably directed at economists who are not all themselves super elites, but who deserve a special award for being the legitimizers of the elites in the policy arena. <coughs> they, meaning the economists, or our modern priesthood setting the rules of the game and creating justifications for growth at any cost. They call themselves scientists when, in fact, they mostly just cram data into unexamined and untested models. But economists for follies do not absolve the media, the politicians, or corporate leaders. Indeed, everyone in the top, say, 10% of global income earners. Why couldn't these people have seen for themselves what was happening? After all, it doesn't take genius level intelligence or higher math skills to foresee that the exponential growth of population and consumption on a finite planet will inevitably lead to disaster. I'm reminded of Upton Sinclair's pithy saying, quote, it is difficult to get a man to understand something when his salary depends on his not understanding this. Not understanding it. <clears throat> Back to Richard. In all of this, I refer primarily to elites in the U.S. and Europe as these people have had outsized influence during the past few decades or centuries even, but elites in less wealthy nations, including China and India, have learned their lessons well. Different contexts, same failure. The only notable exceptions to otherwise universal failure are leaders of many indigenous societies who have steadfastly opposed over-exploitation of nature. I'm not going to get into the noble savage debate with Richard Heinberg. Okay. It is difficult to convey the degree and depth of elite's failure without descending into lurid disaster porn. We face not just political or economic crisis, but societal and economic collapse with all that implies. It's hard to think very far along those lines without getting both fearful and angry. <coughs> Complaining about elites is easy these days as economies, ecosystems, and government, inst 
governmental institutions start to come apart, everyone naturally blames the people in charge. Elites have targets on their backs, but usually the criticism at, aimed at them is unfocused, uninformed, or disinformed. Even if you personally favor a specific set of elites, in all, in all likelihood that group is being vilified by someone else and probably for reasons that have little to do with the overarching failure that all elites are responsible for. One is tempted to feel a little sympathy for these people. They weren't around when key decisions were made back in the 1970s that ensured we would be seeing the commencement of crisis after crisis right about now. The current crop inherited a mess, but they have done little to stop that mess from getting worse. Actually, given the lures of growth and the disincentives entailed in trying to stop growth, perhaps it would have been a miracle if elites had not failed. Could they really have resisted the enticements of cheap energy, higher profits and returns on investments, and more jobs, comfort, convenience, and mobility? Rejecting the gospel of growth might lead to loss of social standing or exclusion from one's tribe or peers. Then there was the competitive angle. If you did not grow your economy or company, those other people would grow theirs and you would be left in the dust. Further, the public eagerly helped elites fail, in effect demanding that they do so. Politicians like Reagan who promised more growth were routinely elected while those who questioned it, like Jimmy Carter, were punished at the polls. Still, failure has persisted even when scientists, some of whom are virtually the only elite truth-tellers around, have sought to reframe our overshoot problem in technocratic terms with a simple cause, carbon emissions, and an equally simple solution, an energy transition away from fossil fuels and towards solar panels and wind turbines. Even though this prescription cannot deliver a full solution to our ecological social dilemma and promises merely to gingerly push society in the general direction of greater sustainability, elites seemingly still cannot bring themselves to do much. Now they are left in an untenable situation. They can no longer avoid confronting problems that took decades to materialize and that cannot be solved quickly or painlessly. And I'm finally at least seeing the end of this book-length manuscript. Looking back, at complex societies around the world through the past few millennia, it is clear that the failure of elites is nothing new. Indeed, given enough time, elites nearly always fail. They get too greedy. They overestimate their own intelligence, can you say uh, Donald Trump, and they discourage people around them from conveying bad news, we don't want to hear it. When they do fail, society sometimes just descends to a lower level of social organization. People dust themselves off and move on, returning to a simpler village-based way of life. 
the James Howard Kunstler model. Other times when crisis comes, elites divide with factions taking advantage of failure by presenting themselves as problem solvers or avengers. This rarely leads to peaceful outcome, but it is a pretty good summary of what is happening now. Okay, so what should you and I do about this? The best strategic response for ordinary people would probably be to build grassroots horizontal power networks and get out ahead of the failing elites by doing whatever will minimize the crisis ahead. This makes sense especially at a time when global integration is unraveling, supply chains are broken, and there are plenty of opportunities and incentives for substituting local products for imports. Nevertheless, institutions of horizontal power, co-ops, citizens, assemblies, intentional communities, take time to organize. If I were to offer some advice to elites, it would be as follows. It was never going to be easy to do the right thing, and it will be even harder now. Start by telling the truth. You're going to get blamed anyway. Why not use your position of influence to increase public awareness of what is really happening and why? But, dear reader, do not hold your breath waiting for elites to get it right. I have used this essay to channel my own exasperation at cowards in high places, some of whom have enriched themselves to obscene degrees even as so many others languished. Rail against them a little or some based on your level of outrage, but I would advise directing the bulk of your energy to moving on. Anything that further divides us makes it harder for humanity to do whatever is still possible. A better path would be building personal and community resilience ahead of what's coming. Ease the suffering. Save what can be saved. Amen, brother Richard Heinberg. We'll forgive that little bit of hopium uh, at the very, very last paragraph, but that is a good uh, a summation of the global elites as I have ever heard in my entire life. This should be required uh, reading for every wacko from the left and the right talking about what the problem of the global elites is. Anyway, thank you, Richard Einberg, but I have got to get ready to go to a picking party and move on while I still can. And I suggest you do the same. Say bye. Sancho says bye, guys.